All right, welcome back. So next up we have Dr. Sarah Weatherspoon. Uh, she trained at Cincinnati Children's and has joined us by way of Memphis. Um, and she'll be talking to us about infantile spasms. Thank you. So I want to talk with you today about infantile spasms, both from the broad perspective that I would want, you know, whether general neurology, general pediatrics, um, or epileptology, things to understand at different levels. Um, it's a diagnosis you don't want to miss. And so we'll be going through some of the natural history. Did I do this correct? Yes, okay, thank you. Um, so I am uh, do a little bit of work with Norellis who make Valtoco, but um, nothing relevant to this talk. Objectives of this study, um, to review the natural history, work up in treatment of infantile spasms, and to understand the importance of rapid access to infantile spasms diagnosis and treatment using a multidisciplinary center as a means of bridging the gap from patient to an effective provider. And we'll talk about what does an effective provider mean. So just a couple of cases that are, I'm sure, familiar to many of us, how these patients may in, um, cross our paths. So this is a little story of a girl that I saw several years ago who had been a 28-week preemie, um, but no major neurologic complications in the NICU, mainly respiratory, did quite well. Um, she began to have some events where um, her arms would come in and flex and her eyes would do a funny little roll upwards, lasting about a second each, occurring in clusters that her mom noticed. And her mom was a nurse and realized that this was something that seemed out of the ordinary, um, brought it to her pediatrician's attention, who um, not unwisely said, you know, let's watch this for a week. And if it keeps going on for a week, then I'll go ahead and send you to neurology to get this further investigated. Um, but the mother said, okay, well, we'll see, but her anxiety was growing, so she got on the internet, she looked at some YouTube videos, which, uh, as much as we know that the internet can be a dangerous thing, sometimes, especially as it comes to spasms, I found it actually be a helpful thing of getting um, parents to a diagnosis for spasms. And so the mother saw some of videos of very similar events of what her daughter was doing, and said, I know I'm really worried because these are spasms and I recognize this as a seizure. And with her own medical background in nursing, she really pushed the envelope to get into neurology very quickly rather than waiting the full week, letting just a, after a couple of days, she was in our clinic. We got an EEG, it was diagnostic. We came up with a diagnosis of spasms for her daughter and started her own treatment. She's actually done really beautifully and they sent me an email um, just this week of, she's now five years old and just amazing, seizure free doing wonderfully, being a good big sister. Um, so this is a typical story, and this is a video. Um, it's part of a repository that, so this is not my patient, but this is exemplary of what these events look like. Can you help me start it or I just click it? Okay. So this is a little baby where um, she was brought in for similar types of episodes that were paroxysmal and brief. And she would pause, like you see right here. And then she goes back to crying. And between the crying is when she's normal. The pauses are actually the spasms. And sometimes they're very subtle. It may just be a brief pause, a brief eye roll, a brief stiffening of her arms. And they last just one second. They would be easy to miss if they only happen once, but usually these are happening numerous times a day. So they start to garner attention. Here she goes, a much more dramatic one. And sometimes you see this crescendo effect where the cluster itself will start off very mild. And then as it progresses over the next few minutes, becomes much more dramatic and involved. And sometimes babies will become very fussy between spasms or after a cluster's over. So these are some of the four key features to know about spasms and to recognize them is, first of all, this flexor extensor semiology. So it may be flexion at the elbows, it may be extension outwards. Sometimes it's a subtle head drop, sometimes it's a dramatic head drop. It depends on how much motor control that infant has. If they're already hypotonic at baseline, it can be hard to see any head drops or neck flexion. Sometimes it's much more subtle, just a jaw opening or an eye opening or an eye roll. Although I tend to see that more in pre-treated infants or as, um, again, at the beginning of a spasm cluster when it's starting off in that more subtle phase. They tend to cluster. So this means that the spasm itself is just about one second long, but it will occur for that one second. A few seconds will go by of relative normalcy, the spasm happens again, et cetera, off, on, off, on, multiple times, usually for anywhere from three to 10 minutes. 
Again, the duration of the seizure itself is seconds. So this is very different than status epilepticus or a focal seizure going on for two or three minutes. The seizure itself doesn't require intervention in that moment. Typically, they don't stop breathing. There's not usually dramatic vital sign changes that are dangerous. The seizure is very, very short, but it is very, very dangerous as we'll discuss. And we tend to see these mainly during sleep-wake transitions, or they'll be occur most prominently during that time. So soon upon awakening, within about 30 minutes, the parents will note that they start to have this cluster. They also are often missing clusters, understandably, because you know, as we know, infants like to wake up at night, and sometimes you don't see this, but they may do it uh, at 2 a.m. when they're waking up during an arousal period. We tend to see that when they come in and get hooked up to video EEG. So there are a lot of things that can mimic spasms, and this is one thing that I think leads to sometimes a delay in diagnosis, is we, these benign things, um, these normal baby movements sometimes, like a moral reflex, are much more common than spasms. And so surely when these children are coming through just a regular appointment, it's understandable that most likely the benign things are gonna be at the top of um, a provider's mind. Things like benign infantile myoclonus, benign sleep myoclonus, and I think this is very critical. So spasms tend to occur during wakefulness, sleep myoclonus occurs during sleep. Um, Sandifer syndrome is something we've heard a lot about, um, especially in general pediatrics. This is essentially really significant reflux um, that is um, associated with some back arching and posturing that can be paroxysmal. Um, I've had patients, um, one patient with tuberous sclerosis who actually went through the GI clinic first for bad reflux in these events, and the GI nurse practitioner called her neurology nurse practitioner friend and said, I don't think this is reflux, I think this could be seizure, and sent them to our clinic, ended up getting the diagnosis of spasms and eventually tuberous sclerosis as the underlying cause. Breath holding spells, so there can be a lot of posturing and stiffening with these events, but should be preceded by crying or a knock on the head or some sort of thing that makes them upset typically. And then there can be other seizures that can look like spasms, and these are best distinguished on the EEG or visually, but things like myoclonic seizures, which is more of a brief lightning bolt twitch that may not have the same EEG features necessarily as spasms do. So this is what a normal baby infant EEG looks like, right? A lot of us recognize this, or if you're not familiar with looking at EEGs, it's a nice, smooth, squiggly pattern. Each line on here represents essentially um, two electrodes, and so each line has its own space. It's not touching the other lines. We call this normal amplitude. It's not really tall. Nice, smooth, squiggly looks. This is what we call hypsarrhythmia. So hypsarrhythmia is a term derived from the Greek for mountainous or chaotic and lack of rhythm. So that mountainous feature is how high these brain waves are, usually greater than 200 to 300 micro volts. And so as we tend to say in neurology, the lines touch each other. If you turn it upside down, it looks the same as if you turn it right side up. There's not really a good organization. It's chaotic. Um, there's lots of spikiness to it, lots of big slow waves. Sometimes there are periods of electrodecrement where it's relatively flat in between. That is also abnormal. So this is the pattern that we're looking for in a child who may have spasms. However, about 18 to 25% of children with spasms will not produce this pattern but still have spasms. So they may just have an abnormal EEG. Maybe they have some spikes. Maybe it doesn't look so bad. Maybe it's a little on the slow side, but it doesn't really meet all the criteria for hips arrhythmia. That doesn't mean they don't have spasms. And in my experience, this tends to occur most in children who have underlying um, brain insults, children who've had significant HIE, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Uh, maybe they had intraventricular bleeds as a premature neonate. These children don't always produce a really um, classic hips arrhythmia pattern and therefore are often overlooked because they may also have some funny movements. They are already having some developmental delay. So you may not get that good story of regression that we associate with spasms. So those are babies that I worry about, frankly, the most of the diagnosis being missed because this pattern on EEG of hips arrhythmia is pretty clear cut when we see it. And again, this is the interictal pattern. This isn't what they're doing when they have a seizure. This is what they're doing when they're not having a seizure. We see it most prominently during sleep, so it's very important to get sleep on our EEG recording if we're concerned about spasms. Um, and what we think is that this is disrupting normal brain development. So we know if we don't get spasms treated, that that child may go on to have significant developmental delay. We're gonna come to some of those prognostic sorts of things a little bit later, but um, what we think is going on is almost like a status epilepticus pattern that there is a normal, an abnormal pattern disrupting normal myelination and brain development that if it is not corrected will cause 
long-lasting neurologic problems. So this leads us into the idea of an epileptic encephalopathy. So it's not just the seizures themselves. Again, spasms are one second long. They don't cause vital sign disruption. We don't need to urgently treat them with Versed infusions or propofol infusions. However, they represent an underlying process that is very disruptive to normal brain function, and if not addressed, will cause neurologic decline. Sometimes I'll liken it to, like as I'm talking with a family, that the spasm is like a fever. The fever alerts you that there's an underlying infection that you want to go after and identify and potentially treat. If a child comes with a fever, you're going to look in their ears, you're going to listen to your lungs, you're going to think about pneumonia, ear infections, viral infections, you're going to treat those if possible. Similarly, the spasm seizure itself isn't so awful, doesn't cause damage in and of itself. It is a red flag that something is going on underneath that needs to be addressed. So our treatment goals are both to make the spasms, the seizures stop, but also to improve the EEG. You don't always get rid of it or make it, excuse me, totally normal, but you want to look for improvement. One of the things that's important in figuring out about spasms is what is causing it, because there are numerous etiologies. About 60% will have an identified etiology that are either a structural, like a hemimegalencephaly, genetic, like an SDXBP1 or trisomy 21 is very common, infectious, like HSV meningitis in the neonatal period, or metabolic, like a pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy. But 40% will fall into this unknown category. It doesn't mean that there's not something there. It just means it's not the level of our understanding. And in terms of workup, we're going to usually want to get a brain MRI to look for one of those structural causes or something that points us to a definitive diagnosis like tuber sclerosis. We want to get some genetic testing. We'll often send these epilepsy gene panels. And then I send them on to my colleague, Dr. Ulick, for more in-depth testing if I haven't come up with anything. Metabolic studies are not very high yield, but they have a role and a time and a place. So let's talk about treatment a little bit. Um, we have two main um, categories of treatment. The first is what we call hormonal therapy, which we'll refer to as ACTH, or prednisolone is what we tend to use. Um, so this was first described in 1958, or first published in 1958 by Gibbs and Gibbs in Belgium, where they used ACTH to treat children with infantile spasms or what they called the hips arrhythmia of Gibbs at that time. And what they found was a dramatic response. Now, they used it a little bit differently. Sometimes they used it for up to a year. And as you and I know, we tend to treat for two weeks at a high dose and then wean. But what they found was this was really effective. So this has become a mainstay of treatment. In the United States, it's in the form of Akthar, which is considered natural, meaning it's derived from the um, pig pituitary gland. In the United Kingdom, they use tetracosactide, which is a synthetic form. Um, that, so when we look at studies, you'll see both mentioned. We often hear, often in other institutions, we use prednisolone because it's readily available, relatively non-invasive. We all know that these hormonal therapies will come with potential side effects. Most commonly, I see a, you know, irritability, quite significant. I tell families that their child's going to sleep like a newborn. They're not going to sleep well anymore. They need extra hands to help them care for that child during that time. They may be hungrier and want to eat more. Rarely, they may see some blood pressure spikes, so we tend to have them monitor that when on the high-dose regimen. But we don't really see the um, elevated glucose. I don't check those sorts of things because it is a short-term treatment. So we do two weeks at a high dose, and then we wean off. And at the two-week point, we really should know, did it work or did it not? The second treatment that is um, effective in about 50% of patients is going to be Vigabatrin. This is an oral medication. It enhances or it increases GABA in the synaptic cleft. However, that's probably not its really its mechanism for treating spasms because there are other things that are GABAergic, are benzodiazepines that don't treat spasms. So there are probably some downstream effects that we don't completely understand at this time about why Vigabatrin is so effective for spasms, particularly if there is um, in, this, in the setting of tuber sclerosis, or in my, um, that also means if there's an underlying dysplasia of the cortex, this can be particularly effective. We know that there's some potential side effects of Vigabatrin. The most common that I will warn families about, of course, are drowsiness, low tone, being somewhat zoned out. Those are common side effects. Uncommon side effects include this permanent peripheral retinal injury that is irreversible, extremely rare, um, not really seen as much in pediatrics, more so in adults, does not affect their central vision, so it does not cause blindness, which is a misunderstanding that's out there. However, we do so, of course, warn families about them and have to sign special paperwork saying that we discuss this. <laughs> 
And then another potential thing that we rarely see are MRI changes. These um, diffusion restriction, especially in deep gray matter, um, that often is asymptomatic. I see it a lot in the TS population because they're going for annual MRIs anyways, and lo and behold, it's on there because they're on their MRI because they're also in vigabatrin, but they have no symptoms. However, it is rarely associated with dyskinesias and sometimes some significant vital sign changes. Other treatments include ketogenic diet or epilepsy surgery. If we know there's a lesion, like a dysplasia, we can go after. Then removing that can be curative. And then I want to talk a little bit about diagnosis and prognosis. So this case for me really highlighted the importance of making the diagnosis early. This was a baby I took care of who was born full term but had hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and he was in the NICU for quite some time. He was placed into um, the care of a foster care mother who really um, watched him carefully and started to notice at eight months of age he was had been making some developmental progress despite the HIE. However, started to have some regression, stagnation of his development and these events that were spasms. These were misdiagnosed at another institution as some other kind of seizure and he was treated with levetiracetam, was not effective. Mom was told specifically these are not spasms, you're, not, you're worried about the wrong thing. After a period of a few months, she came to, um, I happened to see her in clinic. Um, he had hips arrhythmia on EEG, he had spasms, we started treatment. But at that point, several months had gone by and the developmental regression he'd experienced at the onset was permanent at that point. So we know that longer lag time to treatment leads to worse developmental outcomes. So the time from when the spasms start to when they get to, quote, an effective provider, meaning a doctor who starts or a provider, any provider who starts a treatment that is either a hormonal treatment and or vigabatrin. And I highlighted and read these Vineland scores, which are a um, assessment of development that they looked at in children, and they compared that to the lead time to treatment. How long did it take them to get put on treatment? There was a drop in a standard deviation of their cognitive scores if the treatment delay was beyond one week. So you think about the time to get into a pediatric neurologist can be a month these children should not wait a month. It should be treated as a emergent, if not urgent, issue. This was a really nice study done by Dr. Hussein, um, who does a lot of work with infantile spasms, where he said, okay, what were the causes? And he surveyed families to say, what was, how long did it take to get to that effective provider and what were the causes? And what he found was the medium time from spasm onset to effective provider was over three weeks. And I just told you a delay of a week can lead to a shift in standard deviation of dropping it's not quite IQ for violence scores, but it's dropping your cognitive development. And almost a third of patients, um, only a third of patients were evaluated within that first week. We know that the prognosis is dim. Um, if you have infantile spasms, especially if they don't respond or don't get treated, 80% of children will go on to have intellectual disability. 15 to 50% will evolve into Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. In having an infantile spasms clinic, I also have an LGS clinic. So these children have intractable epilepsy that's very difficult to treat, requiring lots of medications and other sorts of treatments. 15% of children with spasms will die prior to the age of 11. And it's highly comorbid with autism spectrum disorder and cerebral palsy. So when treating these children, I find it's really important to come at it with a multidisciplinary approach. It's not just the child neurologist. It's a speech pathologist to assess for dysphagia. Um, there was a ba baby I'm taking care of just recently who's having ongoing viral respiratory infections, multiple admissions, and in the end, he has such significant dysphagia that he's no longer safe to eat by mouth. We were glad to discover that so we can really enhance his overall quality of life by feeding him safely. The neuroradiologist looking for those focal lesions, the geneticist interpreting some of these genetic diseases, making sure we're not missing anything. The neuro-ophthalmologist to help track the, the um, response or potential side effects to vigabatrin over time and more importantly, to look for cortical vision impairment, which a lot of these children have. And then our EEG technologist, nurse coordinator, our neuropsychologist and is tracking their development and nutritionist to make sure these children are growing and optimizing their health. All of these people are very important but at the center of it all, of course, is the patient and their family. So in summary, spasms can mimic normal baby movements, but the EEG is a non-invasive and inexpensive way to determine the diagnosis. As I often say, why would you not order an EEG? If, you've, you're, if you're in a city this size um, and you have access to refer a patient in for an EEG, there's not a reason not to. They don't have to be sedated. It doesn't harm them in any way. Early and aggressive treatment leads to improved developmental and epilepsy outcomes in spasms. And finally, a multidisciplinary approach to spasms improves access to appropriate treatment and holistic care for children with IS. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Weatherspoon, um, for your talk. What factors do you determine or you, do you use in determining whether you're going to start a child on high dose oral prednisolone or ACTH or vigabatrin, perhaps apart from whether or not they have tuberous sclerosis? That's a great question and one of the slides I cut out. But <laughs> um, so there is data that suggests using dual therapy, meaning a hormonal therapy combined with vigabatrin, may enhance spasm response and perhaps developmental outcome in the long run. So I tend to use dual therapy, except in certain cases. If it's tuberous sclerosis, new onset hasn't been discovered before, I'll start with vigabatrin. We know that children with trisomy 21 do not seem to respond well to vigabatrin and tend to have more side effects, so I don't do it there. Um, some of the data out of that, um, that multi, uh, national multi-center trial of dual therapy said children with perinatal stroke actually seem to respond better to dual therapy. So I think some of the data is a bit um, muddy on that, but um, because my, my personal philosophy of treatment is the potential outcome is so uh, dismal and severe that we need to be aggressive up front with the treatments that we have, because beyond these two things, nothing else really is quite as effective. And perhaps a follow-up to that would be, did the use of high-dose oral prednisolone come about because of the exorbitant cost of ACTH and difficulty in access and delay in initiation of treatment? Or is there some benefit even if those factors weren't considered? I think that um, intramuscular injections are hard to give. Um, so especially if I'm taking care of a child who's having a late onset of spasms, like a two-year-old, I can't imagine trying to strap a two-year-old down twice a day to give them a shot like you would a vaccine for several weeks. So I, I think there's certainly even places where you think, well, I would op definitely choose oral. I think oral is very effective. I think it's much more accessible. I think the expense is really um, a United States problem and not an international problem. Um, so I think there's also kind of a mental decision we have about, and this can even be a bigger issue about vaccines and shots and pain and discomfort versus giving something orally. Um, I do see more, it seems like, um, and just speaking from personal experience, not database, that I see a little bit more secondary adrenal insufficiency from prednisolone. Um, because of the difference of where it's targeting on the HPA axis. So it's something to, that I'm more mindful of since coming here and using more oral prednisolone than my prior institution where I use more ACTH. Um, a couple of quick follow-up questions. One, I was wondering if you could comment on the typical timing of developmental regression and onset of spasms. I know those are two are often associated, and so I have heard uh, it argued, well, this must not be spasms because their development is normal. And what is your experience with the typical relationship and timing of those things? They seem to come together, but when spasms start, the typical experience of a family that they share is that they saw it one day, they didn't see it for a couple of days. Then they saw it for a couple of days, then it maybe skipped a day, but then it really became daily. And as they look back, then they start to say, and that's when I noticed something different about my child's development. And you're right, you don't have to have developmental regression. That's where you have West syndrome versus infantile spasms. If we were to really get nitpicky, the syndrome that triad, one of those is developmental regression. But a more subtle thing that I always tend to ask families just for my own learning is did your child stop smiling? And that's very common. So you don't necessarily think about, I mean, that is a developmental milestone as a social smile, but it's not like you stop crawling or stop to this, but they stop smiling. It's a little bit more subtle, um, but a lot of families will endorse that. And I think we had a question back there. know if I even really need this. I, I usually can get everyone's attention without it. Um, I would, so you kind of hinted at this, but are there children that have ner normal ner neurodevelopmental outcomes with when they're diagnosed with infantile spasms? I mean, when I was in training, basically this was like basically a developmental death sentence that, um, you know, that the child probably, especially when we didn't find any, you know, genetic or anything on the scans or, or, or things like that. So that's always tough to answer because the kids who do well never come back to neurology clinic. 
<laughs> but it, I do actually discharge people from neurology clinic because that child is two, three years out, normal development spasm free. And I remember talking with our residents before about this and then like same kind of perception because they see all the worst cases. And I'm very fortunate on the uh, doing, you know, seeing these patients on the outpatient side, I see some of the really good outcomes too. So um, there are children who do well. And if, as you just suggest, as you just pointed out, it sometimes not having an etiology can be bad. Sometimes it can be good. Um, however, so sometimes even though we get the spasms to stop, doesn't mean that child's going to do well developmentally because it's more dependent on their underlying etiology. So if they have one of these significant genetic diseases like that STXBP1, I hope I said that right, um, that, I, that I mentioned earlier, those children, that gene alone is going to cause significant developmental issues no matter what the spasm response is. <laughs>